critical doctrines not only by whether they were theoretically plausible, but by their likely effects on the self-understanding and the souls of human beings. In the same letter, Tocqueville wrote that while he was convinced that Gobineau's doctrines were almost certainly false, he was even more certain that they were pernicious. And Tocqueville called this a probabilistic judgment. He says, I'm never going to be able to prove that this racist stuff is absolutely false. But I can suggest its falseness, and I can prove its absolutely corrupting effect on the souls of human beings. And for Tocqueville, that was good enough. At a time when Tocqueville was studying German in order to aid his archival research for his second great book, The Old Regime and the Revolution, he wryly noted to Gobineau, quote, that he had not yet become enough of a German to be captivated so much by the novelty or by the philosophical merits of an idea as to overlook its moral or political effects. He predicted that of all Europeans, the Germans alone would provide Gobineau with a favorable audience. They'd be impressed by the pseudo-scientific character of his racialism. Uh, Tocqueville also noted that the funders of the translations of Gobineau's work in America and its principal readers were the owners of slaves. More than one commentator has noted the tragically prophetic character of Tocqueville's observation. Tocqueville despised Gobineau's racialist fatalism because it denied human beings the liberty that enables them to better themselves, to change their habits, and to ameliorate the status. He, he, he said of Gobineau's racism that it, quote, reinforced all the evils produced by permanent inequality. Pride, violence, the scorn of one's fellow men, tyranny and objection in every one of their forms. These words are, I think, worthy of much reflection. They capture Tocqueville's deep awareness of the limits of aristocracy, if aristocracy, as in the case of Gobineau, was shorn of Christian deference to the moral law and a humanizing recognition of the dignity of every human soul. Tocqueville and Gobineau continued their dialogue on these themes for several more years, with Gobineau trying without success to convince Tocqueville both of the merits of his thesis and its compatibility with traditional Christian doctrine. Now, at a certain point, Tocqueville had had enough. In a beautiful letter dated January 24th, 1857, one of the most memorable in the entire Tocquevillian corpus, Tocqueville declared Gobineau's position anathema, incompatible with the letter and spirit of Christianity, which clearly affirms the unity of mankind and with decency and good sense. And he forbade Gobineau to ever discuss his political theories with him again. He accompanied this request slash uh, forbid forbidding with a systematic indictment of Gobineau's thought. He argued that a, prof a profound contempt for his fellow men informed Gobineau's reflection on modern society. The very constitution of man bereft of freedom and all prospects for moral self-improvement, thus, according to Gobineau, condemns him to servitude. In stark contrast, Tocqueville announces his refusal to despair of his fellow men. If Gobineau affirmed the, quote, inevitable degeneration of European peoples, who had, he said, fatally intermixed with inferior races, Tocqueville insisted that, quote, human societies, like individuals, become something only through the practice of liberty. In this context, he reiterates his long-held concerns about the difficulty of establishing and maintaining liberty in democratic societies. But he adds, he would never be so pre presumptuous to think such a task impossible. In the penultimate paragraph of this letter, Tocqueville reaffirms his Christian convictions against the cruelty espoused or encouraged by what might be called an atheism of the right. 
It would not be anachronistic to see in this splendid affirmation of human liberty and the goodness and justice of God a critique of Nietzsche's position of avant la lettre, before the fact, before the letter, literally. Tocqueville's beautiful cri de coeur is worthy of extended citation. This is the penultimate part of his letter to Gobineau. No, I will not believe that this human species, which is at the head of visible creation, should become the debased flock that you tell, it, tell us it is, and that there is nothing more to do than to deliver it without future and without recourse to a small number of shepherds who, after all, are not better animals than we are and are often worse. You will permit me to have less confidence in you than in the bounty and justice of God. That strikes me as being one of those letters that comes from the depths, or the expression of a sentiment that comes from the depths of Tocqueville's soul. And in the same letter, he told Gobineau that he took a profound and noble pleasure in following his principles. The principles at the foundation of his refusal to despair of the human capacity for liberty under God and the law. Earlier, in an important letter to his friend Louis Kergelet, dated December, 18, December 15, 1850, Tocqueville eloquently stated the nature of those principles. They, he said, transcended the great historical divide between the aristocratic and democratic worlds. Tocqueville told his friend Kergelet that the forms that are called constitutions, laws, dynasties, classes, have, quote, no existence in my eyes, independently of the effects they produce. I have no traditions, I have no party, I have no cause, if not that of liberty and human dignity. And Tocqueville's fidelity to human liberty was more fundamental than his attachment not only to a democratic or aristocratic social state, but to monarchical or republican political forms. Tocqueville didn't particularly care if France had a constitutional republic or a constitutional monarchy, as long as it was a regime that protected the liberty and dignity of human beings. Now, I'm going to say a brief word about Tocqueville's understanding of liberty. Um, I've already said that his, or suggested, that his understanding of liberty and human dignity has next to nothing in common with contemporary liberal political theory, academic theory, and little in common with, in fact, it contains a radical critique of uh, the contractualist, contractualist liberalism of Hobbes or Locke with their speculative positing of the original freedom of and equality of human beings in a pre-political state of nature. Human beings escape the inconveniences of the state of nature, threats to life, limb, and the prospects for commodious living, comfortable living, that result from the absence of an overarching political authority for the sake of security and comfortable self-preservation. That's what we can call state of nature liberalism. Tocqueville belongs to an altogether different moral and political universe. In a celebrated passage in the third chapter of the third book of the old regime of the revolution, Tocqueville warns, quote, whoever seeks anything from freedom but itself is made for slavery. Tocqueville elsewhere recognized 